Thank you for coming to Community and Communication in Games as Services. Welcome Robin Walker from Valve. Hi, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, as the title says, I'm going to be talking about community and communication in Games as Services. Uh, I titled that a long time ago, uh, and in retrospect, I don't think what I'm talking about really is only applicable to games as services. I'm going to be talking about communication broadly, uh, and it's really applicable to pretty much any kind of product. But we use games and services as a window to, uh, to look at it. And by games and services, what I really mean is uh, products that are essentially have business models defined by retention. Right? Their goal is to keep customers coming back, and they typically do that so, so through some kind of regular update cycle um, in some way. And as, when I say communication, I'm not talking just about writing words that our customers read or, or anything like that. I'm using communication to refer to the sort of broad concept of interaction between us and our customers flowing both ways. So in terms of why this talk, why do we think this is interesting enough to talk about? Well, as a company, Valve has plenty of experience running products that we would think of today as games as services long before we started using terms like that. Going all the way back to things like Half-Life 1, where we were really trying to build it as a mod platform, and through multiplayer games like Counter-Strike and Team Fortress Classic and so on. Uh, so we've got lots of experience building those kinds of games, and we thought we knew what we were doing. But it was interesting that when we launched Team Fortress 2 in 2007 and started embarking on the years of uh, service around that since then, that we realized through the act of doing that that we'd been missing a really important piece. And this graph sort of shows you what piece we'd been missing. This is the first year of Team Fortress 2's growth. So this is the peak concurrent users of Team Fortress 2, uh, where we start back in September. There's an initial leap up right there. Uh, that's just when we came out of beta, actually. But then you can see for the first six months or so, as we run our service, we ship constantly. Uh, at this point, we're trying to go as fast as we can. We probably averaged about three updates to the product a week. And they're not just minor little bug fixes or anything. They were, you know, that's new content, new, up, you know, new features, and so on. And we did a great job of trading water, essentially. For six months, we do a fine job staying about where we were when we started. We uh, are doing a reasonable job keeping our existing customers happy. Uh, and we're pulling in new customers, but there's always churn, so we're not pulling in enough really to start growing. Uh, but then, around the six-month mark, we decided to change our strategy. We started bottling up our updates into larger chunks and focusing a bunch on how we talk to customers about them, the way we communicated the updates. And as you can see, we saw an incredibly significant difference in the response we got from customers around that. We started selling a lot more copies. We started retaining more customers. It just starts building. And this is essentially a strategy we then ran for the, next, the following you know, several years. It's worth noting that the difference between that first six months and the second six months is really a, just communication. What we were actually doing inside the product it didn't change significantly. We were still just trying to you know, do things our customers want to do, make it as fun as possible to play Team Fortress 2. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how Team Fortress 2 grew uh, through a number of things, but primarily through communication. We're going to talk about how it went from the 500,000 total players it had back in 2007 to the 3 million it has today, uh, and how it manages to enjoy a 20% year-over-year growth uh, right now. It's bigger today than it's ever been, and in six months it'll be bigger again. And it's managed to do that with a team of no more than 15 people at any given time, and with zero dollars spent on marketing or anything like that. It's been done essentially solely through updating the product and communications around those updates. We think this is really applicable. Uh, to you and whatever kinds of products you build, because we didn't use anything you don't have access to. We didn't use, you know, leverage the fact that we sit in the same building as the Steam team or anything like that. We largely use the internet, and we all have access to that. And in a, the other reason we think it's applicable is because we've been having a conversation around this for a while now with some of our Steam partners, and they've, some of them have already started to replicate our successes by following, uh, some of the, taking some of the lessons we learned, applying it to their own games, in some ways finding new things we hadn't figured out. They've already started to see significant changes in their products, to the point where uh, uh, one of our partners' single best days on Steam was after they did their first update, where they really started communicating carefully around their update. Uh, and the other reason I, I think that it's interesting to, to pick TF2 is the 500,000 total players worked out to be about 15,000 uh, concurrent players at any point in time. And there are a lot of products in Steam that, that sitting around that stage uh, today and maybe uh, for, you know, look like interesting targets for this kind of approach. 
hopefully as we go through this, uh, in addition to showing you how you could do the same with your product, well, I hope to expand your concept of communication, to make you realize it's a lot more than just talking to your customers, uh, that it can be much more than one directional, you push information onto them, that it can be two dimensional and that can be extremely valuable to you. And that communication isn't just marketing. Marketing is a component of communication, but communication should be thought about much more holistically. And finally, I hope that this starts some further conversations. I think as an industry, we often talk a lot about how we make our games and the ways we should make our games, but we don't actually spend a lot of time talking about how we should talk to our customers about our games. And it seems like something we could all learn from, and we would really love to hear from you about things that are working for you. So we're going to cover two particular types of communication throughout this. We're going to start by looking at communication around the product. Uh, and this is, you can think of this as communication designed to identify and highlight the improvements in the product. So they're almost like really high quality uh, release notes or really high quality change notes. And then second from that, we're going to look at communication external to the product. So this is communication where, uh, like forums or forum posts or blogs or anything like that, where developers step outside the cycle of the product improvement to talk to customers about something specific. So let's start looking at communication around the product. To, before we talk about this, we've got to quickly establish the delivery method that Team Fortress 2 uses, just sort of broadly, so you can understand the stuff that's going to follow. So TF2, optimally, would like to ship a major update every one to two months. Uh, if you ship faster than that, we found that you tend to just lose value. You, it's more, it can be as efficient at retaining your existing players, but it gets harder and harder to pull in new players. And some of that is just the mundane effects of the fact that if you ship too much, third-party news sites just stop talking about you. They stay, you know, there's not enough of an event about the fact you update, so they don't cover your updates. For each of the updates we're going to talk about, we have a general broad communication process that looks a little bit like this. Uh, the update launches, the, sorry, the update's existence launches, essentially. You can't download the update yet, but the update is announced with a landing hub of some kind followed by several days, three to four typically, of uh, information releases every day, followed by on the final day, the update itself actually ships and customers get their hands on it. So in that framework, we're going to look at a bunch of the, the, pieces, the various types of communication we can use in each of these steps. Uh, for time, I, I can't list them all, so this is not comprehensive by any means, but I've selected some that I think have interesting principles that you can take to build, uh, build your own. Uh, and it's also worth noting, not all of these um, elements exist in every one of our updates either. Uh, novelty is important through this, so constantly changing things is useful. So let's start with our communication launch. This is the first thing that announces to the world, essentially, that there's a new update coming. This point here is essentially uh, a, a heads up. It tells new sites, get ready. We're about to start releasing stuff. Make some room on your new, uh, in your feeds. We're going to start talking about it pretty soon. It also lets your players know that they should start getting ready. And that means they can start anticipating things. And for a player, it's actually really fun to anticipate something for something you love. It's great knowing that, oh, in a few days, we're going to get, a whole, we're going to get Christmas, right? It's going to be awesome. Uh, and it gives them, both of those groups a place to come back and keep checking on. But it also lets your, new, lets your existing players start playing the update ahead of time. Because the other thing that happens is that we dump a huge bunch of information upon them. So this usually accompanies the actual the announcement. There's usually some, form, some chunk of media, like a movie or a comic or something, that includes a, a bunch of information. And this information is generally in narrative form. The reason for that is largely that uh, it's just more fun to read. Uh, and you want the stuff to be fun to read, or they won't, they won't read it. Um, and the, the point of the information dump here is where we basically want to ignite speculation in the community. So we want the community, the, the sort of goal we have here is for the community to start playing the update in some fashion up until the point the update actually hits the product. And so we're going to deliberately craft things for them to do. The first thing we're crafting for them to do essentially is speculate about what's in the update. And so to do that, to make that a fun game as opposed to just random guessing, we need to give them a bunch of information, some of it which looks really interesting and things that could hint at stuff that's in the game, some of it may be noise, and let them talk, you know, spend time on forums everywhere arguing about which bits are, are, are going to be important and which bits aren't. We use movies and comics, uh, movies, and there's trade-offs there. Movies, of course, are a lot more expensive to produce. Uh, they have a higher value to third parties, which is useful. Uh, you know, if you want a new site to cover your update, then giving them a piece of content that's valuable to, to their view viewers that they can embed in their site is going to make, it more, make them more likely to cover the story because they get something out of it. 
Uh, and of course, movies tend to have greater visibility to comics. They're less impenetrable. If they, they'll go into places like YouTube and so on, and other customers, it may end up being the point of contact for your product to a new customer. Comics are obviously a lot cheaper, but they actually do have a couple of uh, interesting uh, ways that they're useful. They contain a lot more exposition than you can generally get in a comic, uh, which is really useful for when you're trying to dump a bunch of information on your customers uh, uh, so that they can start speculating. And, uh, and they're obviously cheaper, but they can actually be even cheaper than you realize. Um, typically, our, our comics are, are done by uh, a writer working on the side, in the margins, essentially, while the rest of the team is building the rest of the, the actual critical pieces of the update. Uh, and our writers have even found that they can go out and find uh, high-quality um, artists in the community who have been doing great fan art to get to and, and bring them into the process of building the actual comics, uh, doing the artwork for the comics as well, getting comics down to the point where really it's just the cost of a single writer. So after we do our initial dump and our information uh, and the launch, we wait 24 hours and we start and we release our next chunk. And now we're going to basically start doing this every 24 hours until the update goes out. So why do we do that? So obviously, we're trying to build up anticipation in the customers. We want them to get excited. We want them to keep salivating. We really want them to enjoy it more when it arrives. And, and, and teasing with that over time is going to make that um, more, uh, more impactful when it arrives. But there's some other reasons, too. 24-hour windows uh, allow the community time to digest each piece of information you give them. right? Again, you want them to play games, and one of the ways they play games is by talking a bunch about the things that you've told them and what could come next. And if you, if you dump all that on them at once, then it'll be hard for the community to parse that. You know, it's, if you've got 50 new weapons or whatever, it's better to let them walk through those five weapons at a time. So we're going to talk, cover, after this, a few different types of sort of 24-hour games for the community to play. But there's another advantage to this sort of uh, this stage-wise press sort of information release before the update goes out, and that is it allows us to measure the quality of the communication itself. So we can observe the change in the in the both the player behavior and the sales of the product in the period the communication period itself before the update actually lands, and that's useful. It lets us see that, for example, the heavy update was significantly more uh, effective in its communication than our previous updates had been because there was a much larger increase in the in the, in the customer reaction to that communication piece alone. It's completely separate from uh, what was actually in the update at the end of the day. Finally, these 24-hour periods mean that we start getting feedback on the elements of the update before the update's actually out. And that's great because we get the sort of first impression from people about the quality of things. But it also means we can modify the release of the up we can actually modify the update before it goes out. And this is a technique we've used multiple times. There's been times where we've seen customers propose or suggest interesting small features as a result of seeing the communication that we were able to then get into the product and ship from the day the update actually went out. And they weren't actually aware that that communication alone improved the product. So let's look at some of the things we can do with those daily communication pieces. So the first one's pretty obvious. We should highlight the features that we're going to ship in the update. And so this is a matter of you take the features that, you would, that you're shipping and you call them out. You explain them to customers as part of the communication uh, process. Um, this gives us a few different advantages. One is we get to position each of our features in the way that is useful to the feature. So for example, if we've introduced new training modes to the game that are specifically designed to help players who played the game and then quit two years ago or something, uh, then we can position the feature towards those customers. And these are features that if we were to not communicate them external to the product, if they were just in the product's release notes and just in the product when you fired up, they would never have any chance to actually reach new players. And so if you have features that are designed to bring new players in, it's critically important they're communicated outside the product itself as part of this communication flow. Obviously, this is information that the community then starts to speculate on, which is great. Again, we get feedback ahead of time. Even if you have updates that are really just a list of small features, none of which really feel big enough to call out that significantly, package them up into some kind of thing like on, on the, uh, that we have on the far right, it'll still feel, make the update feel media for anyone who's not part of your process or you know, who's not playing your game right now, who comes across this sort of thing. It increases the perceived value of your updates. It feels like the product is living, changing, growing significantly every time. Uh, so you, you, again, you're just getting more, work, more value out of the work that you're already doing. And of course, you do the same with gameplay features. Uh, you know, take whatever it is. If you're shipping new weapons or anything, call them out. If you're shipping new maps, call them out. 
like, you know, we get a bunch of the same value that we get for highlighting features, but it also uh, creates one of the most fun games for fans, which is theory crafting. Right? Take, looking at every one of the weapons or every one of the individual gameplay elements that happen to be arriving in the update and talking about them ahead of time. Because no one can play it yet. So all you can do is theorize about oh, how massively that's going to change the competitive scene or how this is going to ruin that game or whatever, oh, all this stuff, right? You get to have fun with it. The community conversation around that is, again, really useful. We learn a bunch about how people's first impressions color you know, the, their response to seeing how, how, these game, how these weapons might impact the game and so on. But they often end up generating future ideas for us. Right? The conversation around how the balancing of this is broken, it would be better if it worked that way or whatever, tends to create uh, ideas that we can then leverage in the future. By drip feeding, you know, when you look at this kind of release of communica this kind of communication over time, you, we also give them time to consume each of these, right? If we dump all those weapons at once, it's going to be really hard for the community to really parse them all, right? If, if the first time they really experience those communities, those weapons, is the day it all hits the update, there'll be so much new stuff in there, it'll be hard for the community to really pull it apart, digest it, and have a good discussion about the impact of each of them. So by giving them time to do this, we'll actually increase their perceived value at the point when they get their hands on it. Uh, there's other minor things here. It allows us also to connect these gameplay elements to other parts of our communication. For example, the Scorch Salt weapon in the bottom left there, that's a new uh, weapon for the Pyro. We featured it in the Meet the Pyro movie that, that um, launched the update that that weapon came out in. And so the customers have seen that weapon in a video a couple of days ago, and they, of course, all realized it was a new weapon, and now they finally get to see its gameplay effects. And we have seen, uh, we've been able to, to uh, measure the, the success of this in that products, uh, sorry, um, Things like that, that, if there are virtual items that you, you sell or anything, if they're featured inside your narrative, they will sell more as a result of that. And that's true also for non-virtual goods like merchandise. If you highlight those inside your narrative, they will end up selling more as a result. It's also just more fun for players. If you, have any, if you can connect your narrative and your game together in some way, uh, then you get, it, it can solve problems for you that can be fun for players. Uh, flavor is a good example. It's hard, especially in something like Team Fortress 2 that's a you know, high action, frenetic game, to do any kind of sort of, to explain complex things. And so if we want to have something like the Demoman sword be p a possessed uh, sword that wants to collect the heads of its victims, it's, and, and that should, we want that to, ex to manifest itself in some way inside the product, but explaining that inside the product can actually be significant work. So we can do that explanation inside our accompanying communication narratives pieces. And for a customer who's paying attention to our narrative, they understand more about the product now than customers who didn't pay attention. So that's an interesting concept. We, we can do more with that. We should look, uh, and we'll come back to that. So, Let's get into a little more interesting stuff than just communicate, you know, talking about things we're shipping. We can use things like metagames to be it's essentially wrappers that cause our existing customer base to, to effectively market the update or increase the visibility of the update to customers who aren't yet playing our game. So for example, in the Soldier versus Demoman update, we had a thing we called the War, which was uh, a, a, a metagame that ran around the product throughout the communication period. So the new update's not out yet. But while they're all waiting for it, and we're talking about what's coming, we put them in this war situation, which is essentially game-wide across all the servers in the world. We're recording every time a soldier kills a demo man, every time a demo man kills a, kills a soldier. And there's visibility inside the product and on our web page and so on about who's winning. And we have a unique new item that will go to whichever one of the classes kills the other class more. The community has a huge amount of fun with this. Uh, and in the process of having fun, they're, they're generating a huge amount of visibility for our product. Every forum is full of customers talking about what's the current tallies. There are you know, community groups organizing. There is a medic group that is formed that refuses to ever heal soldiers and all this sort of stuff. Uh, people have banners inside their forums for all of their forum signatures about, you know, go team soldier, et cetera, et cetera. So the community is having fun, and they're fulfilling a valuable service for us. They're competing with each other, which is, something, which is a commonly used technique. The community has a lot of fun with that as well. 
And we can take things like contests and so on and expand that concept of metagame to even, to even more customers. If you don't play a soldier or a demo man, but you still want to be part of this the, the, the sort of community-wide narrative that's going on right now, you can contribute in other ways. So we have systems like, so we take something like a contest, for example, allow anyone to uh, contribute to that, feed into that community competition, appeal to more people than just the people who play soldier demo, and further fuel that marketing that, that, the, um, that our customers are doing to potentially new customers. We can use that concept of co contest to solve other problems as well. Uh, for example, at some point, uh, we wanted to do some economic tests around hats, uh, and we needed a description every, for every one of our hats, and we had a lot of hats, and not enough time to, to name them all. So we ran the first ever hat describing contest, which was a, quite an opportunity for customers to just provide descriptions for every one of their hats in the games. And this one was interesting because for the first time we start seeing uh, uh, something that's part of our communication, something uh, purely outside the product essentially, directly start to modify the product. So the results of that contest push into the product and now permanently modify the product itself. And that's something, that's a really powerful concept. This is, now, now that we're getting somewhere, right? In the same way that the results of the soldier and demo man war permanently impacted the product. Right? The, the soldier won the soldier demo man war, and so he got the gunboats, and that was, you know, that war occurred two years ago, and he has those gunboats today, and he'll have them forever. And so we have here a piece of what was purely the communication around the update permanently modifying the product going forward. And the, the reason that's important is that it means that our communication now matters. If you care about the product, you care about where it's going to be going in the future, you care about understanding how it got where it is today, you care about knowing more than a new player, you have to pay attention to our communication now. And that, that's powerful because it's a, it's a positive loop. The more our customers pay attention to our communication, the more we can use it, the more we can do things with it, and that will make it matter even more, and so now they'll want to pay more attention again. So let's run with that. Let's talk a little bit more about other ways we can essentially reward the attention that players uh, might, uh, you know, reward players for paying attention to our, to our communication. So back when we first started on this path, um, like everything, we try to do, every, do as much as we can with as cheaply as we can. So initially, we just tried polls, which are incredibly clumsy, but they were a way of getting customers, essentially part of the customers interacting with the communication to impact the product. So we just took a decision that was as simple as, well, what's the order in which you unlock these three weapons that we've built? And we just let the community decide. Now, polls are incredibly easy to implement, so there's not really any excuse for not, for not doing at least this, but it's not very interesting. It's not very fun as a player to play a poll. And worse, we've, the poll forces us to artificially constrain the range of ways that customers get to impact our product, right? We have to have decided that up front, and it seems like we can do better than that. So the next thing we started to do was starting to just essentially fill our communication with hints. So we would take the, the elements we've already talked about, the highlighting of the features in the product or the highlighting of our new weapons in the spy update, and we would put them into our communication pages, and then around that, we would fill it with essentially hints, noise, narrative, everything that seemed interesting, entertaining to read, some of it which was things we had talked about uh, doing in the future, some of them were things that were just essentially one-off jokes, other things that were just you know, fun to read or whatever. Uh, often cases, this was like comics, was done by our writers, occasionally pairing with community people or whatever, just you know, doing that work in the margins around the work while we build it, you know, that the rest of the team's doing building the update itself. And like the, the elements around game, uh, you know, communicating our gameplay, the point of this is it starts, it increases, the community starts to play the game, right? The game of figuring out which one of these bits is meaningful, which, which one of these things will matter, which one of them matters today, which one of them matter, will matter uh, a, year, a year from now, and so on. Speculation of this kind of stuff is a fun thing to do if you're a fan of the game. And if you write, you essentially, you know, if you're the person who sees the connection that, you know, in this latest update to something that was teased, you know, two months ago or something in some other update, you get to win the internet, right? You're the person who saw the connection. And an example of the, the degree to which they can get, uh, there are videos on YouTube with hundreds of thousands of views today that, that cover the two years of hints that led up to our eventual release of the man versus machine update. And those two years of hints weren't expensive. They're all just little bits of work we did here and there, touching on things. They're like a single texture here and a single localization string there and so on. Again, this is all about getting your customers to care about all the elements of your marketing. You want them to peruse your marketing, your communication, so on, with a fine-tooth comb and pay attention to everything. 
this sort of stuff will snowball. It won't matter at first to customers because you first have to show them it will matter. So your first sets, they'll, it'll be noise, and then as they suddenly start to realize this stuff will matter later, then they'll start to pay more and more attention to it. You can think of this almost like, um, well, th there's another concept here that's worth thinking about. It's not just applicable to this sort of narrative-like approach or anything. So let's look at another example. Um, about three months before we released the engineer update, we released this video online. So the foreground and background and textures and a bunch of other stuff that's hidden inside this, even just silhouettes at the front, um, uh, essentially hints at things we were thinking about. Right, there, are, there are elements in that we took a bunch of the ideas we had for the update but hadn't yet figured out, uh, and we put them in front of customers. We essentially gave them a bunch of concept art, and we, and we waited for them to react. And the community became, you know, did their theory crafting thing. They pulled it apart, they decided that that looked interesting, that wasn't interesting, and so on. The community became obsessed with various things. Then we could take the, the information we were getting about what they cared about and actually build that into the product. So they, they took things like the robot arm, for example, which was a sketch on the background, on the, I think, the whiteboard behind the engineer. The robot arm was there because we were building robots for our man versus machine update that was going to come out a year from now, uh, like a year later. But our customers saw that and, and thought that was a robot arm for the engineer, and that it was clear we were planning that all along because the engineers had a ro yellow glove on his right arm the entire length of the product, so he had a robot arm all along, and Valve's really clever, they figured out all this stuff. So uh, we were able to take their love and ob obsession of the idea that the engineer could have a robot arm and deliver on it. So to us, now we're getting somewhere that's really interesting. Our communications become essentially fully bi-directional. Uh, we, we're delivering them something we know they want because they essentially told us they wanted it before we build it. And so uh, this, this is efficient, right? It, it's far better than, say, the polls example, where we had to decide the scope of which of the information or the dynamic range of which the information the community could give us. Here, it's unbounded. The community can come up with things we didn't even anticipate, we didn't even foresee, and we can still deliver it to them at the end of the day. But not all of our communication is going to be that deliberate, obviously. Sometimes we, uh, we communicate in ways we don't even intend to, uh, especially in any kind of living product where you're constantly shipping. It's, it, is, it takes a lot of effort to make sure you don't accidentally ship stuff. You know, we'll always accidentally ship localization strings or textures or models or a sound we didn't mean to mean about and so on. It turns out that that doesn't actually, it's, it's okay. It's not dangerous. In fact, it turns out to be really, really helpful for many of the reasons that it's probably fairly obvious having gone through the previous things. It's going to cause the community to have a bunch of discussions. It's going to cause the community to have a lot of fun. They're going to pull apart what you, everything you ship. And the moment they first discover something in one of your, you know, somewhere in your files that you didn't intend to release that then matters in a later update, they've realized they need to do that with everything. So they're going to pull apart everything you ever ship. Uh, to the example, and, and this snowballs like all other communication channels, uh, to the point where today there are, people, there are prominent members of the Dota 2 community, for example, whose visibility is essentially due to the fact that they pull apart everything we ever ship, they will peruse every XE for, for strings, they pull apart all of our textures and so on, and they live stream this to usually tens of thousands of viewers as they examine the, the details of every update we ever ship. So the community has fun with that, and of course, what we get out of it is we get a bunch of information about what the community thinks of something we haven't yet finished yet, we haven't shipped. Uh, and sometimes this is critical. Uh, a good example would be at one point when, during the uh, building of Team Fortress 2's microtransactions, we were working on a virtual currency solution based on the assumption that we would have to have a virtual currency because everyone had virtual currencies. And interestingly, we accidentally leaked some information in our localization string that just gave our community the hint that we were thinking of heading in that direction at all. And it caused the community to have this long and involved discussion about how, how they did, the things they did and didn't like about virtual currencies that we learned a ton from. And it helped us understand the exact form of currency that they would like us to ship and also helped us build essentially the perfect fact ever, you know, that we could have ever built that explained to them exactly, or it basically answered all the questions they had because we had seen all the questions they had about the things we were planning on doing. So, which turned out to be a really useful thing and something we've, started, we've done ever since. <clears throat> Even something as, as mundane as achievements can be 
can be increased in value by communicating. So you should look at everything you are shipping and ask yourself, is there some value we can get out of communicating this in some way that's novel? For example, achievements. When we release, when during the update page releases, the day we release achievements for a class like the Demo Man, we just put the icons and the names of the achievements up, which means the community spends the next 24 hours playing the guess what that achievement is game, which quickly morphs into, well, design good achievements for the Demo Man game, which means that now, the next time we need 30 more achievements for the Demo Man, there's a ton of really good Demo Man achievements designed out there. So take everything, even something that's mundane achievements, and ask yourself, how can, we, how can we make this fun for customers to get a hold of this ahead of the update? How can, we get, how can we get value out of their attention on it? So with all, we sort of run through a bunch of stuff there. Let's recap. Let's look at you know, what, what can we extract out of all that stuff. So when we think about communication around the product, if possible, wherever we can, we want it to be fun to play, and we want it to reward the attention they pay to it and we want it to matter to the game itself. And if we can get all those things, three things to be true, then our existing customers will pay a lot of attention to it. They will care about it a lot because with all those things there, they, they pretty much have to, to act if, they, if they like the game that much. And it, if we do those things successfully, then they will generate attractiveness to new players. Like the, the act, designed properly, the act of the, all those things coming together will cause the, 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 the enjoyment our existing customers are having around the product and the visit the act of them playing the update will, fountain, will create things that cause new players to see it and increases visibility. And as, as both our new players do that and, sorry, as, as our old, existing players do that and our new players pay attention and so on, we want all their interest and play and so on in that space to teach us as much as possible. We want to be able to extract as much information about that, about what we're doing and what we're thinking of doing as we possibly can. So if, this is, if these are essentially our goals for our communication, it's worth having a quick look at the kind of development team or the way we should set a development team up to ensure that we're successful in this space. Obviously, we're talking about an incredibly tight integration between the game itself and the communication around the game. So it's pretty critical that your, your core development team is responsible for all of this. You can't have two separate groups designing these two things. Uh, you just won't succeed at, 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 the, 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 at the degree you need to for this stuff to matter to customers. So you want your, your, your development team to be responsible for designing this, for building it, and to be involved. And importantly, as they're designing and building their update, they're already starting to talk about how are we going to communicate this to customers, because there's no better way to ensure that something communicates well than to change the design of it so that it does. You don't want to have any kind of live team or maintenance team or anything separate from your development team, right? The process of, of improving the product and developing on the product is the process of maintaining product. No separations there. Luckily, this is just game design. If you look at the elements we're talking about here, this isn't like a traditional marketing concept or anything like that. We're talking about building game design where the game itself sort of starts to extend outside the product and onto the internet itself. And so the, the development team you've got are probably really good at this uh, already. Uh, and it's also important that this team has essentially a culture of listening. Right? They should regard the process of gathering feedback about their work as valuable work and something that they need to do. It, obviously, they should do it after they ship an update, but it's something they should just be doing on an ongoing basis. Right? And if you're an organization that has that struggles with the idea of employees uh, reading forums at, at work time or anything, you've got to change that. Right? It needs to be. It is work to sit there and peruse forums to see what customers think. And there are times during your update process where it's critical that you do that. And it's, as part of that, essentially, you need to make this team feel like it's responsible for the community. If you have some external community management group or a community team or anything, then you, that's essentially telling the development team it's not their problem to keep the community happy. That's their problem, right? If the community's unhappy, they'll deal with it. You can't have that. The development team has to regard it as their problem. If you have community managers, just integrate them into the dev team. Move them in there. They'll find other work to do along with, you know, in the update itself. There are plenty of ways that other people can uh, add other than just writing code or anything like that. So, and this is a good time to move on to our next type of co communication. So, we've been talking a lot about communication around the actual improvement of the product. Let's talk about external communication, which we identify, so forum posts, blog, blogs, emails, and so on. So, back at the start, we identified this essentially as communication that's outside the flow of the improvement of the product, right? It's much harder than product communication, uh, or much riskier, so let's start, uh, let's try to understand why. And fear not, like, this is a lot, shorter than the other bit. So a typical scenario involving external communication might look something like that, this. 
you see a customer report a bug in a forum somewhere, and so you as a member of the dev team, you post reply, say, hey, yeah, that's a bug, I'll fix it, and then you go and fix it. And that would be great. Unfortunately, as you get into it, you find it didn't quite work out like that. Maybe you get in there and you find out that bug's a lot harder to fix than you thought. Actually, it, it, it's not something you're going to get out of the next update. Maybe you won't get it out for months. That's a really significant bug. Or maybe it involves trade-offs. Like, you can fix it, and that customer will be happier, but now a bunch of other customers are going to be less happy. So what do I do there? Well, maybe you find out that you can't fix it. Like, the trade-off is so great that you can't fix it. Like, yeah, we could fix it, and we have to drop support for Windows 7, and that's not something we can do or whatever, right? You can't fix it. Or maybe you should find it, you just, even if you could fix it, you shouldn't fix it. Maybe, we're, maybe as you get into fixing it, you realize this bug is entwined in our balance of our game, and if we change this, suddenly now our entire our competitive game balance is off, and it's all kind of screwed, so we can't fix it. The problem is, by posting in that forum and saying, yeah, I'm going to fix that, our piece of external communication has now made it harder for us. It's made our life harder. It's done two things that are worth noting. One is that it changed the community conversation around the bug. And so this is most easily thought of, imagine if it wasn't a bug, it was, it was a piece of balance suggestion or something like that. Well, now the community, is, you've, you've interjected an official voice about what we as the dev team think is right into that community conversation. And the problem there is that we don't really want to be, we, the best feedback we get from our customers is typically the feedback, it's the things they say to each other when they think we're not there. Right? We, want, we don't want to color their opinion of the product with our, you know, necessarily what we're trying to do or what we think is right or anything. We want customers to have that conversation and we just want to sit there and listen to it as much as we can. So if we start coloring that conversation, telling a bunch of customers that, oh, the official voice is that that bunch of customers is right and this bunch of customers is wrong, then we've, put, we've permanently altered that conversation in a way that will cause us to get less valuable uh, feedback from that, uh, around that entire topic potentially forever. We've also added friction here with that choice, and it's specifically friction about our ability to make the choices that are right for our customers. If any of the, you know, the four examples we have for why you can't fix the bug turn out to be true, what you're essentially saying is that is even though we said that we'll fix the bug, the right thing for our customers as a whole to do is to not fix the bug. So we want to change our mind, and that piece of external communication has now increased, uh, made it harder for us to change our mind. And it's really, really critical that we can change our mind uh, like today or maybe at any point in the future, right? That piece of external communication is on the internet. It will be there forever. And if in five years from now we realize, it, you know, we've done five years of learning about what's right about our product, our customers have learned a ton, we've evolved the product, the right thing to do is to actually implement something different, that piece of external communication is still out there. So even if it all works out perfectly, like we say we're going to fix the bug, we fix the bug, everyone's happy, it may still come back to bite us later. And even if we made that cust so even if we make that particular customer happy, he's at risk of being made unhappy in the future by the fact that we come, we've gone back on our word. And it's, it's important to realize that this concept of we need to be able to change our mind is the whole point of games as service. Like the whole point of running products that you publicly iterate is to change your mind as a response of the pro as in response to customers impacting the product, right? If we weren't going to let customers interactions with the product change our mind, then we should have just kept the thing inside and worked on it for five years and then unveiled it and walked away, right? But the whole point of doing public iteration is we want them to change our mind. So we need to be able to do that. But unfortunately, bad communication is worse than none. And if we define bad communication as any, is communication that just turns out not to be true, something we said to our customers that they know isn't true now or unfortunately any time in the future, or any communication that just makes our customers far more confused or less sure of, of what we're doing or their trust in us, then we, that, that form of communication costs us more than if we hadn't said anything in the first place. As we've talked about, they have ongoing future costs. They may reduce our ability to operate or make good decisions in the future in that space. And it destroys people's, our customers' trust in our decision-making process. And they, it destroys their trust in, the thing, in, our, in our communication. Right? If we communicate uh, 10 things and five of them turn out to be false, then their ability to trust the next 10 things we say is going to start decreasing over time. And if you think... So if you think back to that bug fix example, the core value that we provided in that, in that scenario is fixing the bug. That's the bit that mattered. The external communication piece simply increased the risk for us. Uh, you know, as I say, it, it may have 
made that particular customer happier than if we just fixed the bug and not told him we we're going to fix it, but we certainly put that person in greater risk of being far less happy if we said we we're going to fix it and then in the future changed our mind. So in the end, ultimately, the best form of communication uh, around the product is simply to improve the product itself. It doesn't do a bunch of the things that we've, ta we've talked about external communication doing. It doesn't reduce our future options. We can always change the product. The product just is at any particular point, uh, and we haven't pr produced a record of our justification for its state that, that will turn out to be invalid in the future. The product inherently reaches all of our customers, both today and all of our future customers. That bug fix is something that adds value to our, all of our customers today. That bug fix will, will uh, make our customers' lives better in the future as well, as opposed to that piece of external communication, which, best case, you know, there's no way it will actually reach all of our customers. Because improvements to the product actually solve issues, right? They don't placate customers. They don't make them happier in the short term. They literally just solve their issues. And, they, and improving the product generates clean feedback, as we've talked about. Uh, it doesn't change the community's conversation in a way. Like we haven't injected our opinion onto uh, necessary onto the conversation they have. So all they can do is react to the actual state of the product, and we get clean feedback, which means we can make better decisions in the long run. Does that mean we should never use external communication? No, actually, there are, there are times when external communication is fantastic. Uh, a good example is when it's so, we can use it to solve problems where the updating the product can't fix, because those kinds of problems do exist. A good example would be the Dota report system. Uh, Dota has a system where users can report other players for being offensive, and then this big black box system up the end does a bunch of stat tracking and then decides that some users shouldn't get to talk to other users. And what's interesting about those kinds of black box systems is that users tend to build mythologies about how they work. And as you iterate on them, unfortunately, because they don't have any kind of, uh, you know, you, you can update them 10 times a day and users don't know, as the system itself evolves and you iterate upon it, that evolution is often invisible to users. And that was the exact case for the Dota report system. We shipped it about a year ago. We did significant iteration on it uh, for, for months and months. And about the six month mark, it was, we, we realized that the, the, the conversation the community had around the system was essentially producing no data for us because the way they thought it worked was so far afield from the way it actually worked that even though they're having rational discussions, the assumptions of the discussions were based upon uh, resulted in us not getting good data. So, but we, sat, we were able to go away and build a solid piece of external communication, a blog post that really broke down how the system worked, the data behind it, how it was, work, you know, the, the, the way we were measuring it and so on, that was able to reset the community's understanding of how the system worked. And the primary reason we did that is because now we get good feedback again. The community's conversation around it is more valuable because they're more connected with how the system's actually working. It is important when you do this kind of stuff to make sure you are addressing the actual problem or the real problem that's making customers unhappy. Uh, it, it's often the case that when users are requesting you to communicate with them more, that the real cause of that is because your service or your product is failing them. A good example that was fairly public was the diatide uh, um, update in uh, Dota last year. Diatide is our annual Halloween event for, for uh, Dota. We didn't ship one last year, or we weren't planning to. Our customers were pretty unhappy about that, and it resulted in us, uh, you know, shipping it in the end after all. From a customer's perspective, that was a product failure. It turned into a communication failure, but the primary, the cause of it was just fundamentally we failed them in our service. If we'd shipped Diatide, never would have been an issue, and they would have been happy. But when done right, external communication does generate a bunch of value. Uh, it's interesting that if you think of it in the same way as we thought about our product-focused communication, uh, you, play, uh, you apply many of the same lessons or the same goals that we want it to be interesting to players and new players, uh, so existing players and new players, that we want it to reward attention, that we want it to be something you can kind of play, um, that we want it to matter to the game, that hopefully we could, it'll be in a form we can extract data out of. If you apply all those things to your external communication, you can get a lot of value out of your external communication too. Um, an example of that application could be thought of in, in blogs. If we, held a, uh, if we decided we wanted to have a weekly blog post and that we were going to post every week, uh, it would be highly likely we would produce poor external communication. Right, because we would decide to talk to our customers not when we had something to say, but just because the calendar date had arrived. It, would be far, it is far better for us to do rarer uh, blog posts that are always 100% high value uh, than it is to do regular posts that really would just 
teach our customers that most of the time we update, it's not really that interesting. And that's, uh, it's far better to have communication in general that, every, that your customers are always asking you to do more of because every time you do it, it is super interesting than to have communication that, whenever you, that you do so often uh, that you know, when you do it, not many people talk about it, new sites don't talk about it, and no one cares. And that's, you know, that's a sort of a fair description of how we want to be, not just with our external communication, but with our communication across the board. So wrapping up, um, hopefully I've uh, encouraged you to think about how communication fits uh, sort of holistically within your, the process of growing your game over time, that it's worth approaching your communication broadly, that it's not just this one-way thing, that you can, you can get a lot more value out of it. It can be more valuable to your customers than you think, uh, and it will result, hopefully, if you do it correctly, the activity that customers, the, the enjoyment that customers will have in playing it will result in you getting far more data, and you can be explicit about that. You can deliberately craft channels to ensure that the impact, that the, the um, results of your customers impacting your communication is a bunch of extra useful data for you that helps you improve your product. And then when your customers are unhappy, and they will be because you know, we're not super devs, um, the, the right reaction is to sit back, stand back a little bit and look at, uh, look at the core of what's making them unhappy and figure out how you can improve your product so that hopefully it never happens again. Uh, and then when you go to ship that improvement, you know, think carefully about how you can communicate it to get the most value out of it. And that's what I have. Uh, so thanks for listening. I hope it was interesting. If you have... Uh, you know, as I said at the start, we think this is a topic that doesn't get really talked enough about in our industry, so we'd love to talk about it more. My email's there. There's a bunch of us, pretty much anyone on the TF2 or Dota team or, or anyone working at Valve who's been involved in our service products can have a great conversation out of this and would love to hear any thoughts you have. Uh, I threw up the URL of the history of Team Fortress 2's updates, uh, the, specifically the communication. You can walk back through every one of them, going back to our very first ones, which are embarrassingly terrible at this point. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, I think, because you can see that um, you know, you, like, we started very small and very simple, and we just slowly built it uh, bigger and bigger, one update at a time. Thank you very much.